Hi, I'm Phil Spencer, head of Xbox. I'm a white man with brown hair, wearing a t-shirt and a hoodie. At Xbox, we aspire to empower everyone to play the games they want, with the people they want, anywhere they want. An important part of that ambition is making gaming accessible to the over 400 million players with disabilities, including adapting our own games and platforms. We also want to empower game creators with accessibility tools and best practices and build communities where people feel safe, welcomed, and represented. This work wouldn't be possible without the partnership and leadership of the disability community. Thank you to everyone who has shared their experiences and pushed us to do more to make our industry accessible. Today's show is about amplifying those voices and sharing some of the innovative work being done to bring play and connection to everyone, everywhere. Because when everyone plays, we all win. And now, it's an honor to introduce the host of this year's Xbox Accessibility Showcase. He's the creator behind Blind Gamer and an accessibility consultant for the entire industry. It's Steve Saylor. Over to you, Steve. Thanks so much, Phil. Xbox has promised to empower gamers to play the games we want, with the people we want, anywhere we want. Today, our where is here in the Microsoft Inclusive Tech Lab in Redmond, Washington. Hi, I'm Steve Saylor. I'm a content creator, accessibility advocate, and consultant in the video game industry. I'm a white male with blonde hair and dark rimmed glasses. And I am delighted to welcome you to the Xbox Accessibility Showcase. Today, we're going to meet some really great people, learn about great accessibility features, and talk to creators that are making more games more inclusive, and hopefully find your next favorite game. And I have here Solomon, who's the Accessibility Program Manager here in the lab. Solomon, thank you so much for allowing us to be here today. And can you tell us a little bit about yourself and what you do here at the lab? Thank you, Steve. Yes, I am a medium-build white man with a prosthetic hand. And what we do here in the lab is provide a space for the disability community to come and collaborate with Microsoft. This is a space for and by people with disabilities, not about them. So the work that we do here started with the Xbox Adaptive Controller, which I am a huge fan of personally. Yep. And that has helped us grow our inclusive design from there. And now we cover all of Microsoft's products. So why don't you tell us a little bit about the evolution of the space, not only just within gaming, but just beyond that. The Inclusive Tech Lab started five years ago. It was so popular with our teams that we expanded to this newly opened facility to allow us to expand our scope as well. So we do still have a space for gaming. We've got space for education now and productivity and remote work and sensory and all of that. So it's allowed us to broaden that inclusive design practice. This place obviously covers a bit of gaming, but uh, within Microsoft itself, what else does the uh, lab uh, cover? Now we cover all of our Surface devices, our accessories. We partner with software as well. So if it's a piece of hardware, it comes through this lab. Well, perfect. Well, thank you so much, Solomon, for allowing us to be here today. We promise not to wreck the place throughout the <laughs> showcase, and we'll just jump right into it. So I'm standing in front of the famous fiber optic jellyfish here in the lab, so we'll be seeing more of them as we go through the showcase. Now, we all need to play. Everyone's ideas of play is a little bit different, but ultimately, it's the same drive to learn, to feel, and to connect through fun. Whether that's going on a solo adventure or playing with friends online or in person, they allow us to explore, prompt us to imagine and enrich our lives through play. I find it extremely satisfying to be able to play games with friends and accessibility is a huge part of that. Where as a kid, I used to think that I really sucked at games, but in reality, it was that gaming sucked for me. So more or less, I decided to dedicate my career and my life to accessibility so that kids growing up today don't have to feel like that they suck at games and that their disability is getting in the way. Kaylee grew up playing video games with her dad, Eric, and allowed them to be able to connect through tough times and also physical separation. Kaylee, Eric, thank you so much for joining us. Um, why don't you tell us a little bit about yourself and what you're currently playing right now? Kaylee, we'll start with you. I'm 18, I'm about to go into college uh, at UCLA, and I am currently playing a cute little game called Coffee Talks. It's on oh, Game Pass. Yes. 
you just play as a barista and, well, spy on your customers' lives, essentially. <laughs> um, it's a really cute, chill game. I've been using it to decompress with, well, the stress of moving in. Sure. Um, in between packing and everything. So, yeah, I've been playing that recently. Awesome. Eric, what about you? We play every once in a while just on stuff that just shows up on Game Pass. I'll just pick up something, and for no reason at all, I'm, I find myself... Uh, you know, it's like uh, trying lawnmower simulator or something along oh those lines. Oh my god, that is so addicting. Yeah, it's oh. some strange stuff, but yeah, popping around to a lot of things. Like that leads me to my questions. Like I wanted to ask, how, when did you two start playing together? Like how has gaming sort of like brought you to uh, to being able to enjoy gaming? I mean, literally since I can first remember, we've been playing games together. She loved playing the Lego stuff. And then the rock band was just, it was so, the whole family was playing it. It was so yeah. great. And then it was, you know, Fable showed up mm -hmm. um, yeah. a little while down the road. And she, weirdly, as a little kid, uh, there was this funny story where <laughs> I went to go to work. I was like, don't leave town. You can still play because she was good about talking to people in the town. So I come back. Xbox is still on. Just the TV was off. I was like, okay. So I turn on the TV. <laughs> And everyone in the town had a heart above their head. She had made every villager fall in love. And they were like, we could get married. And I was like, what have you done? It was just so funny, but it was just so her. But she would get into these games. And so we started playing from yeah. the time she was about four years old. Why don't you get to tell us a little bit about, um, like, how does that, how does your disability kind of affect your day-to-day -day life? Well, for me, with my narcolepsy and cataplexy, like we've been talking about with, you know, chill games, cataplexy is generally triggered by intense emotions. So there are times when I'll get, like, really, really stressed in maybe, like, a multiplayer first-person shooter game. Sure. And... So cataplexy is, you know, sudden loss of um, muscle tension. So mm -hmm. my muscles will just kind of cease to function. You know, I'll drop the controller. Um, my neck might, you know, drop a little bit, um, that kind of thing, depending on the severity of it. With that kind of thing, uh, I'll usually have to, you know, switch to like a more chill game, something that... Um, isn't stressful, like mm -hmm. I said, like a coffee talks kind of game or, um, you know, lawn mowing simulator, something that yeah. doesn't require me to, you know, have to focus as much. There was a lot of different games that clicked better with her, you know, having certain ones that did, you know, this certain feature or, you know, combat free, like you were saying, like what Minecraft and some of the other ones is like, oh yeah, I want to play just you know, story mode on something like that. It was great. It gave her the opportunity to do that. So, yeah. My narcolepsy um, affects me in the way that my sleep cycle is messed up in that I don't get restful sleep so that during the day I get tired and I fall asleep multiple times during the day. My early years of high school, I had to be taken out of school because it was affecting my learning so much that I was always like kind of absent in class physically mm -hmm. and I had to be homeschooled and that really affected my learning and obviously it affected my social life as well and prior to my narcolepsy I was very active physically. I played volleyball, I did fencing and I was also active in show choir but as my narcolepsy got worse, I had to stop doing those things because I was not only a hazard to myself, I was a hazard to everyone else around me because I would, you know, trip and fall or I would fall asleep during a routine. I was obviously devastated when I couldn't do those things anymore, but luckily I was able to continue playing video games, which was obviously still like a huge part of my life and it became even more a part of my life because it filled the social aspects of my life that were no longer there because of school because you know I could connect with you know people my age online when I was playing games that I couldn't talk to in person. Obviously being able to uh, like Eric as you said like seeing Kaylee grow up and, and and playing different types of games how have you been able to still keep playing together um, uh, as 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 the life kind of moves on when we first got the Series X and then we you know we jumped on Game Pass I was just like I'm going to introduce you to Halo yeah. and she started playing so it gave her a year and she worked through all the stories she worked through all of them and then Infinite came out mm -hmm. and she was just like yeah I'm cool with 
playing, you know, so he got her into playing online. You know, that was just, it was so cool to see that whole kind of evolution of it. Yeah. And we just get into all these different games and it was just, you know, to do some of these different ones that, you know, I, I would have never thought that I, you know, the little <laughs> playing, you know, Lego Star Wars on the screen, you know, side by side, <laughs> yeah. but then years later, here we are, you know, we're in a galaxy flying around in spaceships and building bases. It is really cool to see over like 10, 15 years time that, you know, our gaming has gotten to this different level. Well, thank you two so very much for, for joining us today. It is an absolute pleasure getting to know you, and I wish you the best of luck in, in school, and I can't wait to be able to, uh, we're going we're gonna to fire a team it up, and we're going to go into Destiny, we're going to do King's Fall Raid. Oh, yeah. So oh, there we go, yeah. yeah. <laughs> so thank you so much. Thank you yeah, so thank much. You. It was a pleasure meeting you, and, and thank thanks you. for having us. Thank you. We all know that games can connect people across huge distances, but they can help break down barriers in other ways too. Special Effect, a UK-based charity, is dedicated to providing accessibility options and services to those with physical disabilities. They use games and other tech to assist with medical isolation and more. Together with the Family Gaming Database, Special Effect created a list of games that have accessibility options for a wide variety of disabilities, including those with reduced fine motor control. Let's take a look and see what this awesome team is doing. Special Effect is a small UK-based charity. We work to help disabled gamers get access to video games. The people that contact us generally are either been able to play before and something has changed or they would like to be able to play for the first time. The work that we do is completely bespoke based on the individual, based on their functional movements, based on the games they want to play. So we take all that information and we create a setup that's completely tailored to their movements to help them play the games that they want to play. We quite often work with young people and children who maybe going to the park and kicking a ball around would be very difficult for them to do. But with the right joystick and the right buttons, then maybe they can really get involved in playing with the family. Even the tiniest amount of movement can be really good for accessing a switch or a joystick. And so we try and get an idea about the person's condition and the movements they may have. And then we can kind of tailor a setup by just doing lots of trial and error with a whole range of accessible equipment. So if someone has difficulty moving their hands, they might find a standard controller is difficult to use. But if they've got good head movement, then it could be that a joystick could be positioned by their chin and they can use either their jaw movement or their head movement to control the character in the game. It's whether they're comfortable with playing is really key to make sure that they're able to game for as long as they want to with the setup that they have. Recently, we've been working with Andy from the Family Gaming Database on their accessibility reports. Finding a game that's a good match for you or your child. You've got lots of different sort of competing considerations, and so helping parents and guardians make those decisions one at a time in a very clear way is really helpful. And then kind of once you've got that base kind of group of games, then you have some more specific considerations, I think, and that might come into this area of disability. So every game page has an accessibility report where we've gone through and assessed that game and we've checked what that game offers, not just in terms of features, but also in terms of design. Looking into this area of accessibility, there are many different ways that you can identify what's in your game and the Microsoft accessibility tags are a really good way that was already doing that before we started. Microsoft accessibility tags can be found on the Xbox Store. And what it is, is that developers can choose to highlight these wide range of accessibility settings, whether it's input remapping, or whether it's adjusting the sensitivity to sticks, or whether it's changing toggle options, to show people what settings are in the game before a player actually buys them. We want to make sure that the games aren't losing their integrity and not losing their heart, but also the settings are also there to help those players to play their games easier, because a small tweak to a setting can make a massive difference to a wide range of players. Learning from the Xbox accessibility guidelines that relate to those tags was really helpful. It gave us kind of a baseline of what's already done. So it really is a sort of a collaborative effort and we're, we're learning from each other. I'm probably learning more from Microsoft than the other way around. <laughs> I think it's probably true to say. Everyone who comes to us has a different reason to want to be able to play and they'll have their own kind of unique story. But I think people want to be included and its inclusion is a huge part of, of what we do and, and why we do what we do. People have a wide range of reasons for playing it. It could be 
escapism if someone has a condition which causes a lot of pain, for example, or, or fatigue. And it can also just be for fun. I think it's easy to think, well, it's only video games. Like, and, and some parents might think, actually, I wouldn't mind it if my kids played less games. But that's something of a misunderstanding, I think, of what games are and the value they bring to a child's life. They really are kind of a, a new media, a new way of making sense of the world, a new way of telling stories, which is why they're so popular and why they're so well fitted to this moment in history for children. And so once you've realised that, then it becomes very clear it's really important that everybody can access this new media and can do that in a level playing field way. I think a, a real kind of key thing is to say, like, never say never. Um, we quite often will speak to people who maybe they were told after an accident or an injury or maybe after their condition may have progressed that they wouldn't be able to play games again. But actually, when, when they get in touch with us, um, we can quite often find ways to play. And as long as we can find um, a way for a person to be able to access a button or, or move a joystick, then there can almost always be a way to help that person play. For a lot of people, gaming is their only outlet. It really gives them that social inclusion that I think we all just, just want to have, to spend time with our friends or just having just time to yourself, just to relax and enjoy things. And that's what Special Effects is all about, is to give people the, the leisure and enjoyment from video gaming, just like everyone else should have. Making accessible games is great, but doesn't help much if people don't know those accessibility options exist. So here's some recent updates from the Xbox team on how they're making it easier to find those options and how to use them for both PC and console players. Accessibility pages have been updated for many games to include default required inputs so that you can prepare your own adaptive configurations that work best for you. Also, last fall, Xbox announced the Accessibility Features tags on the Xbox Store, helping you find a game that fits your accessibility needs. Since then, hundreds of titles have been tagged, and the team is continuing to improve the filtering capabilities to help make finding those games even faster. And lastly, here's a big one. All accessibility control pages have been updated on support.xbox.com. This includes articles such as how to set up Copilot for your PC and many more. So that way, you don't have to scour the internet to find out what those features are and how to use them. For more on how developers can utilize those features, we're gonna sit down with Anita Mortaloni from the Microsoft Gaming Accessibility Testing Service, or as we like to call them, MGATS. Anita, thank you so much for joining us today. We super appreciate it. Can you tell us a little bit about yourself and what is the MGATS? So I'm Anita Mortaloni. I am the Director of Accessibility here at Xbox. And that includes the program MGATS, Microsoft Gaming Accessibility Testing Service. It's a program for developers and publishers of Xbox and PC games where they can get their title validated for accessibility against the Xbox accessibility guidelines. And my favorite part is that they also get people with disability feedback from it as well. The true lived experience from players with disabilities on the experience of playing their game. So where did the idea of the MGATS come from? We had a major game developer reach out to us and ask about us validating the accessibility of their program. And they were super excited about accessibility. They wanted to make a game that was more accessible to more people. And we realized that this wasn't going to be a one-off thing. Mm -hmm. And so we brought together gaming, accessibility expertise, and then most importantly, people with disabilities to create the program called MGATS. How does the program work? Great question. So our, the developers and publishers will submit a title to us, mm -hmm. either pre-release or post-release. Ideally, as soon as possible, but it's totally up to where they are in the development cycle. Sure. Sometimes it's even games that have already launched mm -hmm. because they want to get feedback for the next version of the game. So they submit a title to us and then we will test it on site in secured location because we know confidentiality is very important. Mm -hmm. And we evaluate the accessibility of their title against the Xbox accessibility guidelines. And then most importantly, we bring in players with disabilities to provide that critical lived experience of what it's like to play that game. I love that. And so as someone actually who works in the industry, uh, one of the gigs that I'm actually consulting with, I've actually seen these reports. And I love that it touches on the accessibility feature tags from the Xbox store. It also shows what testers worked on it. And then also just the blockers from like high, medium and low of like what they can be able to do to make their games more accessible. So my question is actually from the developer side, what has been the response like from studios and developers uh, as part of the program? 
You kind of touched on it a little bit. The, it's been overwhelmingly positive. The key thing that folks like is the accessibility tag information. Accessibility tags, you might be familiar with them. Mm -hmm. um, there are about 20 of them that cover key accessibility features for games. Each one has a specific set of criteria. And so through MGATS, titles will find out which ones they are eligible for and which ones they're close to. And so examples of a tag is like subtitles. Subtitles are great, but only if you can actually see them. Mm -hmm. Light gray subtitles and really small font on a white snowy background don't actually cut it. Mm -hmm. And so we go through the criteria and also tell the studios which ones they meet the criteria for. When it comes to the player side, how does this program benefit them? When the publishers and developers get accessibility feedback, it's then incorporated into their title. And it, it results in more accessible games for more players. Very cool. Uh, so what is next for the program? Like you've kind of started, it's up and running. Um, what has been the feedback like from players and developers and where do you kind of see it moving in the future? I, I love this question because I so rarely get to answer it. <laughs> but today I, I get to answer it. Nice. So we are expanding and the MGATS program will now offer a player with disability focus offering. Nice. Right. So the, the program will focus on player with disability feedback. So our testers will give feedback on course scenarios, navigation, settings, communication, and then associate it back with the Xbox accessibility guidelines. And you'll have player feedback from vision, hearing, mobility, cognitive, and or a combination thereof, really making it easier for studios that want to focus on player with disability feedback to incorporate that into their game. Anita, thank you so much for joining us and teaching us all about the MGATS. If people actually wanted to know more about it, can you tell us a little bit more where can people find it? I would point people to the Xbox Gaming Accessibility website. It has information on the MGATS, the awesome Xbox Accessibility Guidelines, the Xbox Accessibility Insider League, all things Xbox Accessibility, that is the place to start. Perfect, and make sure to be able to go check it out. Actually, as an example of the MGATS program, we're gonna be talking to Connor Bradley at ID at Xbox Studios, Softleaf Studios, about their upcoming game, Stories of Blossom, and how they use the MGATS program and the community to be able to make their game as accessible as possible. Have I ever told you the story about Annie and the Crumbles? Claire and I work from home. We have a small office upstairs where we do all of our work from. It's a nice, nice experience. Stories Blossom is a short series of stories brought to life by imagination of a young girl. She imagines these stories and embodies the different characters that take the lead of the stories. It's a way of trying to teach her these lessons through trying to help these other creatures that are in these worlds. Tomorrow is my first day back at school, Grandpa, and I'm worried no one will like me. Oh, my dear Clara, you have no need to worry. Early on in our development, we went in with the mindset of how can we focus on accessibility? And we took sort of a lens on everything that we did and sort of seen, is this accessible? And a big part of that was involving the disability community. It's not until someone who lives their lives with these disabilities that we can verify that what we are providing is useful, but it also identifies barriers that we may not have considered before. And the great thing about doing it earlier, you can then share with your audience what accessibility options and designs have been done. So then they can join in with the excitement with everyone else. One big resource that we've found really useful was the Xbox Accessibility Guidelines. It goes into detail about the personas that could be affected by certain barriers. Today, it's still one of my go-to resources. The work that Microsoft and Xbox have been doing has really been a big inspiration to us. We also heard about Microsoft's gaming accessibility testing service, and we thought this would be a perfect opportunity to have Stories of Blossom tested as well. And we were, we were right. The feedback that we received was phenomenal. Not only did it highlight what we have been doing right, it also gave more feedback from other players with disabilities and raised concerns of 
areas that we should be looking into. Since we took the, the step of developing accessibility early, a lot of what we are doing is sort of design decisions. So there's some simple things like the narrative has been addressed with, can someone with a lower reading age read this text? But on the other end, we have different features, for example, subtitles in, in games. We now offer audio descriptions for cutscenes and in-game events. And when you first go into a scene, you're offered a visual description of what is there. And to developers, the great thing is that any small change you can make to make the game more accessible can really have a huge impact. This isn't just a small number of people. 15% of the world's population in some form is disabled. Now is the perfect time to start looking into accessibility in your own games. It's the direction that the industry is moving and players are starting to expect these kind of features in the game. You don't need a huge team to make a game accessible and I think we are proof of that. Stories of Blossom, we plan to release it early next year, so keep an eye out for that. We'll hopefully be releasing a release date very soon. Stories of Blossom looks great and I can't wait to play it. It's actually great to know that Softleaf Studios use the Xbox accessibility guidelines as a resource to help make their game more accessible. And speaking of the Zags as we call them, they've now been updated based on community feedback to include best practices for touch-based controls on mobile devices. So that way developers can help make games for Xbox Cloud Gaming more accessible. Now, back in May, the Accessibility Developers Resource Hub was launched. Since then, more updates and resources have been added to help make games more accessible. And developers like Interior Night share that same goal. As Does Falls is their most recent game, and it's actually really accessible to a lot of players, including those who are totally sightless. Today, I get to sit down with Mei Wong, lead designer at Interior Night, to find out how they made As Does Falls as accessible as possible. All right, May, thank you so much for joining us. We really appreciate it. So why don't you tell us a little bit about yourself and what you do at Interior Night? So uh, my name is May Wong. So I'm from Hong Kong, but I'm living in London for 15 years. So I'm lead game designer at Interior Night. And then we just released our first game at Dust Bowl. Very cool. Well, I am a big fan of the game, especially for accessibility. So I've been wanting to ask, what was the journey like for you to be able to include accessibility in As Dust Falls? So when we first start designing As Dust Fall, that we know that there's two main aspects of the game, the interactive, narrative drama game, and also the multiplayer aspect. We want to make a game that are relatable story and grounded characters. So we want the player to be focused on the story, but not worry about the compass control, like what button to press. Um, for the multiplayer point of view, we want to create a game that people can play together with friends and family. No matter what the background is, no matter if they played game before or how old they are, it's like kind of like the, the core thing that we want to create. So we know that we need to make a game that are really have like simple mechanic and control system. And then so it'll be able to be approachable and accessible to everybody. So we kind of like decide that this game will be eight players that people can play together locally or online or even on Twitch. They were able to use the controller using the phone as a companion app to control the game or using the keyboard and then the mouse. So it means that there's a different way of playing. Actually, that's a good that's a good point. I wanted to talk about that because you are a, a small team, but I'm, I'm curious as to, as a studio, in wanting to be able to have accessibility in your game, like how important was that? We all love playing game and we want to share the game with like wider audience. I think from my point of view, accessibility feature is not just about for people who have disability. It's also for everyone that who like to play games. Um, one of the examples we always talk about is that one of our colleagues have their grandmom come in to play the game. And then it's just like even that you understand that um, when you grow old, your response speed will not be the same. So you want the game to be able to cater for different needs. I get so excited about it because this is something that, as a blind player, uh, there are a lot of games that are very difficult for us to be able to play. And a lot of it actually comes down to 
where there are games that just don't have either screen reader support or menu narration. And you, you, you and Tyrion and I were able to like integrate the Xbox uh, operating system in a way that was never been seen before, where essentially you have like the narrator, if you have narrator turned on, on, on your Xbox, it'll automatically turn on screen reader in the game. So I kind of wanted to ask, a, how did that feature come about? And also, B, could you expand a little bit on some of the things that you're able to do for uh, blind, low vision players uh, for uh, for As Dust Falls? Yeah, so I think one of the things we're really looking at is that how can they actually come go into the game without any help? What happened if like people already set it up, take the options about the like, manual narration in the Xbox system? then we should be able to get the data to put in our game. And then the other thing is like the, the press data start screen. Then after like 20 seconds, the game will tell you press A to start. So if you press A to start at that point, we will actually like tell you, do you want to keep to having the screen narration on? So if you press it on that time, then the game will actually be fully functional with the narration. So I wanted to uh, move on and ask about sort of obviously your partnership with Xbox uh, and with Microsoft. Um, what resources did you use from uh, from Xbox in helping to develop uh, As Dust Falls? So we have a research team in Xbox. They help us to do like user testing. Um, so they do actually look at our original list and then come by giving us some like, suggestion and recommendation, which is like, I think it's like eye-opening for us. There was like speech to test, test to speech, in game chat, a lot of like things that we may not be thinking about, even like button remapping. And then surely the accessibility uh, document from Microsoft is really useful because like the, the guideline is actually provides so much information for us to be able to like understand what is the main core suggestion for us. So it's super useful. And one thing I really want to call out is also the accessibility expert team in Xbox and also the uh, QA team. They're very helpful for us to testing all our game and then tell us, oh, this one, is the contrast is not good enough because sometimes I think it's a bit um, difficult to kind of like checking each one, but uh, the QA team is wonderful. They help us so much on like getting all the information in one place. I love that. I absolutely love that. So l last question I have with you, May, is uh, I wanted to know if there is, is there any type of advice or a message that you want to be able to uh, give to either the community or to other developers uh, about uh, accessibility? For me, the key thing is about like to bring wider audience to your game because game is such an enjoyable and things for everybody. If you can like, make it more accessible, more approachable, you get to more people. You spend a lot of time, effort. Surely you want to be have like, everyone playing it as well. So plan early and then get more feedback earlier. Great message for uh, for people to hear, for sure. Well, thank you, May, so much for, for joining us today. Thank you for all the work that you do uh, to you and your team at Interior Night. And uh, everyone, play As Dust Falls. Play it. It's great. <laughs> Thanks, May. Thank you. <laughs> now we've talked a lot about programs and resources for developers. So let's take a minute and talk about community. And we're going to go into Steve's story time. So recently, I was playing Sea of Thieves with some friends. And at one point, I kind of got stuck, and I couldn't be able to see where I was supposed to go next. And there were some other players that were playing with us, and they gone so for their head, I thought we were never going to see them again. And as we kept going, we saw those players waiting for us so that we could continue on together and I absolutely love that about the community we actually have a really great program that embodies that same sentiment of having a safe and welcoming environment for all those represented to be able to play games together and have fun and that's the Xbox ambassador program which is a group of players that promote a safe and fun gaming environment and celebrate the uniqueness of everyone including the 400 million plus gamers with disabilities so let's chat with Xbox Ambassador Rose, who's all the way down in Australia, to find out more about the program. Well, Rose, thank you so much for joining us. Why don't you tell us a little bit uh, about yourself and what you do and uh, how you became part of the Xbox Ambassador program? I, um, my name is Rose. I'm an Aussie uh, from the East Coast. Uh, I'm a gamer. I love all things video games. 
I work part-time as a school counsellor and part-time in social content creation for a business. Um, and I became an Xbox ambassador when a lot of my friends in the gaming community joined up. And I went, huh, what's that? And looked into it. As a fellow ambassador myself, I definitely uh, understand like how cool it could be just to be a part of like a very safe and welcoming community. So um, for those who may not know, what does an ambassador do? I am, well, first of all, promoting the fact that Xbox is about gaming and hey, check out this cool game that released on Game Pass. Hey, check out this cool game that I'm playing at the moment. But it's also about in the community, I'm posting things that are inclusive, I'm posting things that are kind, I'm posting things that are fun, um, and, and reaching out to others and making sure that they also feel included in that space. Playing games with other people is social. You know, think of it as filling a social need of feeling included and feeling valued, um, which in my counseling and psychology, I notice is a very important thing that human beings need in life. And so having a program that is really a backbone of Xbox to say, hey, you're not just here to play games. If you want, there are people out there who are inclusive, who are respectful, who are fun and are passionate about the same things as you are then you can access that. Here you go. <laughs> I 1000% agree. And especially with the fact that we're just like, we spent a couple years in the pandemic where everyone was at home and needed that social environment. And that's what I love about the program is that we're able to come together as a community being like, okay, let's, let's hang out. Even though we're on opposite sides of the world, it just allowed us to kind of like at least feel closer together, which I, which I really love. Um, so now, actually, I wanted to ask in regards to uh, accessibility, of course, just being accessibility showcase, um, how important is accessibility to you as being a part of the ambassador program? Accessibility is important to me as someone who has autism and rheumatoid arthritis. So to me, having the ability to be able to adjust audio settings, um, I can think of one game in particular that I won't call out. Um, but there was a part of the game where for about 30 seconds, there's an incessant beeping that just goes and goes and goes and you can't turn it off. Removing that would mean that I would actually enjoy that game. It is right up my alley. But that incessant beeping actually makes me just start to break down and I have to turn it off. And I miss out on that. I miss out on that. What would otherwise probably be hours of my life sunk into that game. I can't play. To be able to turn that off would mean a whole other world has opened up to me. And I think that's what it is. A whole other world opens up to you when it's accessible. And, and an even better example of that is the fact that I have rheumatoid arthritis. So I can do things I wouldn't otherwise be able to do. With accessibility, it means you don't have to be a certain body type or a certain you know, uh, mental health state. It's, it's here for you to help you and to give you something to enjoy. It is so important to have that in video games because you just open up the space even more to a world where they are more aware of other people out there and, and how I can best include them, respect them, love them. My advice to developers would be don't be afraid to ask questions of the community. Um, we will quite happily and lovingly tell you exactly what it is about games that we like, don't like, can use, can't use. Um, it's so important that if you're making a game accessible, that you're investing time in talking to others and doing that research. And and for the community, I would say, you know, it's important that we raise awareness of this so that developers are seeing that this is what the community wants, that if they're going to make the game for us, that they're making it for us and that our voices are loud in that space. I just a thousand percent agree every single time. You're the best. Rose, thank you so very much uh, for, for joining us today. If people wanted to be able to find you uh, and, what, and, and connect with you online, where can we be able to find you? They can find me at Control Alt Craft on Twitter, Instagram, uh, YouTube, all of that stuff. Awesome. Well, thank you so much for joining us today. We really appreciate it. Thank you so much, Steve. <laughs> well, that's the end of our showcase today. So let's recap with a few highlights. First, the accessibility page on support.xbox.com has been refreshed with more support documents on accessibility features and options for both PC and console. Next, the MGATS Players with Disabilities Focus Program is available as of today, providing a resource for developers to directly get feedback from players with disabilities. 
We also learned about how Special Effect partnered with Family Gaming Database to make finding accessible games easier. Lastly, we heard from the developers of As Dust Falls and Stories of Blossom about how they're building accessibility features into their games. Before I go, I want to take a moment to thank the developers who are helping to make our next favorite game. Making games accessible is hard, but think about when we first got into this industry. There was that one game that changed our lives that thought, this is what I want to do for the rest of my life. So when you're making games more accessible, you are changing the lives of millions of players around the world who have never been able to play a game at all. And I want to thank the community for pushing us forward. As consultants and developers, without you, we would not be where we are at today. We would not be able to push accessibility forward without your voices reaching out to us and telling us how to be able to make games accessible for you. The future of this industry is very bright, and I'm so looking forward to what we can be able to accomplish together. When everyone can play, we all win. Thank you so much for watching.